Tell me, who, my job easy. who are these guys exactly <laughs> that you have um, accompanying you? So we have Michele Montoli on bass. Uh, we have Leandro Mancini on drum. Carl uh, James on guitar. And Nadi Ramzi on percussion and body. So they're a kind of a conglomerate from all over the globe. Yeah. Well, I can pick out, uh, let's see, one fellow Italian, I think, Leandro <laughs> Mancini, that would be. Uh, <laughs> maybe. There is a, an Italian, but it's not him. Really? No. Oh, oh it's goodness. a tricky one. It's Michele. <laughs> Michele, then? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. right, okay. Is he from the same part of Italy as you? No, opposite. Opposite end of Italy. <laughs> well, Sudanese, Italy. Yeah, I mean, I'm from the kind of north. West, he's from the northeast. Okay. So, yeah. and, and what does that translate to in terms of place names that we might recognize? Verona is where he's from. Verona for <coughs> Michele. Uh -huh. The home of uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's Valentine's tomorrow. <laughs> it's a busy day in Verona. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was born in Turin, Torino. In yeah. Turin, of the home of the Shroud. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, now, and just the other members of the band. So, uh, Tal James, who's on guitar today, you've been on the show before. We, who with? Just let us know. Shout from the back. Bala. Bala. We love wow. Bala. Excellent, excellent band. And uh, Nadir um, Ramsey uh, on oud and percussion as well. Absolutely fabulous. Nadir is from where? Sudan. He is, so he's the fellow Sudanese person. Yes. Right. Exactly. Now, uh, you are from Turin, um, Amira, but uh, tell me where Sudan fits into your <laughs> life picture. So I was born in Turin, uh, but I grew up both in Turin and Khartoum, uh, capital of Sudan. And um, my whole family is in Sudan, my kind of my extended family. Back, back in Sudan, we have very large extended family. Um, so yeah, so I, I kind of feel that Sudan, Sudan is home. Um, Are you able to go back and visit a fair amount? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's the place, the kind of it's it's the the space that inspires what what I do right now. Yeah. When you say right now, um, was it inspiring you as much uh, seven years ago when you released your debut album? It was. Um, I think it's just been a journey. It's been kind of a process, and I think that with with my musical process, I've kind of been. It's like delving deeper and deeper every time, you know, I've just kind of been pulling out layers in a sense. Um, so I think with, with my first album, I was beginning to kind of explore certain fonts from the Sudanese uh, traditional kind of pot of music. Um, and I think with the years, I've just kind of gone a bit further down that line. Okay. Um, do you think part of the reason you've explored uh, in greater depth as the years have gone on is you've become more confident about more confident or more searching which is it i think more searching i think i find that the more i discover something actually it's just it just puts the bar further you know every time i get to a point i realize that there's actually that 
then opens a door and behind that door there's like another universe and <laughs> you end up kind of you know just going further and further yes yeah uh, part of the reason I asked that question is we meet quite a lot of artists on this program who <clears throat> They've been born in one place, but yeah. they're from another place, if you know what I mean. And they regard the other place as more of their home, more like their home. Yeah. And sometimes there isn't always the confidence to um, to explore everything from that original home. Yeah. Uh, if, if I think of someone like Muklit uh, Hadero, uh, Ethiopian roots, but she's grown up in the USA. Yeah. Um, and it's really only now in her with her second or third album that you can see she's she's much more in uh, yes. in the sounds of Ethiopia. You can really hear that. I couldn't hear that in the first and second album so much. Yeah. But in your case, it's always been there. I, the confidence. I mean, I think I think the the kind of link with you know the Sudanese music, the kind of curiosity, the the pull in a sense, it's always been there. It's been there before I started even my first album or be before the albums, <laughs> you know, because I mean, I was lucky I grew up in a home where that was passed on to me very, um, you know, very profoundly. And like I say, you know, I, I in part grew up in Sudan as well. So I was always very connected to my family. And, and, yeah. and language wise, you're, you're confident in Arabic and so on. Yes. And I think, you know, it's it for me, it became more about it's a personal search. But it's also, I feel privileged to be here, you know, and I feel that the world has, the Western world, if we like, has a lot of misconceptions about Africa and what Africa is and what, you know, all the different cultures that are uh, alive in Africa. And I think for me, I just felt a sense of kind of responsibility to, to show something different, to show that actually, firstly, as Africans, we can define our own narrative we can say who we are, we can uh, show the world what what we have and we're proud of it and we have so much. Yeah. Amwaj, in a sense, the song that we just played now is, is in a sense kind of about that. It's about, and in a sense then it lended the theme to the whole, to the whole album, Mystic Dance. It's kind of about kind of going back to the roots, to our ancestral knowledge, to our ancient knowledge and pulling something out, pulling what is useful and, and valuable and precious to use in the present day, because there's a wealth of that. Mm. And the thing is, it, it's a very powerful album. Uh, Sophie Darling, who is one of the assistants on The World in London, production assistants, uh, told me earlier on that when Mystic Dance came out at the end of last year, um, and Sophie's someone who listens to a lot of different music and a lot of different <laughs> albums that we hear on the show, um, but Mystic Dance is the one that stayed oh, on her you. on her personal <laughs> playlist uh, almost you. on repeat, and that's that's an incredible uh, incredible compliment. I'm honoured. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, are you aware of what kind of connection you make with people when you delve into? the deeper side and the more ancient side of Sudanese music <laughs> and then put that onto an album like Mystic Dance? I'm not, but I'm always kind of very, very like <clears throat> overwhelmed and, and really I feel extremely honoured when if even just one person says to me, you know, I heard your album, I liked it, you know, I played that song, you know, I gave my you know your album to my friend because i thought they would like the music. i mean i i just feel completely completely just humbled and, and honored by that and i i'm still quite in a sense i'm still quite surprised about it because i i don't know to me it, i still see my project as the fruit of kind of the search that we were just talking about and something quite personal and to kind of when you begin to see that you know it, it it transcends that and it begins to kind of connect with other people it's it's absolutely it's really mind-blowing in a sense <laughs> totally mind-blowing yeah let's hear another track from the album uh, that you're going to play live for us what's it to be your second track so our second track is called Manalk. um we've 
translated it for ease into forbidden. So it's uh, a song from the traditional Sudanese repertoire called Hatiba. Um, and it's a song about forbidden love. Let's do it then. Manalk coming up live on the world in London with DJ Ricky uh, at Resonance FM. And it's Amira Kerr and her band that are in the studio with us right now. Thank you. 
by Amira Kerr and her band uh, on a world in London with DJ Ruby. Absolutely well. We, we're just absolutely loving this uh, live session by you all. Thank uh, you. Y'all. Um, <laughs> uh, Amira, uh, you, you sing in, well, you speak uh, at least three languages, Arabic, Italian and English, um, fluently, uh, clearly. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about uh, with your band, um, there's probably only one... There's communication issues. <laughs> <laughs> because apart from Nadir, I, I suspect that no one else in the group has actually grown up with any Arabic language knowledge. And yet everybody is singing along, all the guys are singing along with uh, the songs. Yes. Right? And they clearly love doing it as well. I mean, it's like you can feel the love in this room. It's amazing. And I, and I know it's not because of Valentine's Day tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they're just awesome. They're awesome. You know, I I don't have many words I can I can express. You know, I, they're just awesome. <laughs> I think they, but I, when I look at them, they look at you as though you're awesome. They look as though they're in awe of you, and that's quite that's quite special to see, especially when it's a woman leading a band. Because sometimes the guys look at the woman as if I wish you'd get move aside and we could take over instead, you know. And I can put that up with, with your band. I know with Tal James, it, that would never happen in the room. He's so, he's so sweet. Um, <laughs> But the three languages, Arabic, Italian, and English, how do you decide which you're going to use when? I don't really decide. I think um, the song kind of, uh, okay, I know this sounds cliche, but the song does kind of write itself in that sense. It, the language then is it's just a, you know, a consequence of that. I think uh, different themes will come to me and, you know, in in a given language, I guess, and that language becomes then the, the mm. choice of language for the song. But I think certain s certain themes are best expressed in a certain language. I don't know why, but it, it just kind of works out that way. Tell me about your range of themes, roughly. Are you are you a kind of a, <laughs> well. a, a love, a love, a death, a <clears throat> life kind of theme person, or are you a politics, um, philosophy, and something kind of personal. What, what do you write about? I write about, uh, I think for me it becomes, it's what I would, I guess, call spiritual transcendence in a sense. So, you know, I, I write about kind of what our place is here uh, on earth, what what the meaning of that is uh, it's not that I write about it I think I I ask questions uh, my, my songs are very much about kind of asking these questions uh, you know what is our place what is our role what is our purpose where are we going uh, how can we connect with each other what how can we leave the world in a different state than when we found it uh, what matters? What are what, what are the things that actually matter? You know, is it is it kind of what we're taught to do? Is it just kind of coming, you know, being born, consuming, 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 and then dying, or is it <laughs> is it just kind of is there something else? You know, um, and if if there is, then what is it? So I'm sure there is something else. <laughs> searching. <but laughs> it's searching again, isn't it? It's the searching questions. Yes. In the same way that you you've been searching and digging. Uh, into uh, Sudanese traditional rhythms and scales and styles and yes absolutely because I think it goes you know it's it's a simultaneous search because I think also for us you know people who have maybe roots elsewhere um, that search also becomes about kind of understanding certain philosophies certain knowledge that is passed on to us uh, being able to tap into the richness of heritage understanding that there's heritage and that heritage is one of the most powerful and unbelievably beautiful things gifts that we can ever be um, given and passed passed on and you know what what lies within that what can we draw from that that has meaning that can resonate in the present tense even outside of that location outside of that place let me search a bit into your cultural heritage then because now firstly there's this question of the italian sudanese <laughs> mix 
um, it, it's not uncommon, is there? It, you know, no. Italian African thing going yes. on, yeah, and that's to do with history, the colonization, and so on and so forth. Well, Sudan wasn't actually colonized uh, by Italy, but um, there is yes, there was definitely there was a presence uh, in East Africa, uh, an Italian presence at one point. Um, but yeah, I think you know today there's a lot of uh, migration, obviously. The Italy that, uh, you know, the Italy of today is a very different Italy than the one I grew up with, grew up in, sorry, for example, you know, um, yeah, today, you know, you can go into a primary school and find kids, you know, second generation children from kind of, you know, Italian citizens born in Italy, but with roots from all over the world. And to me, that is something that I am so happy about because in my time, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Wait, were you yeah. the, were you the only black kid in your class? <laughs> I was one of three, but I went to a very special school. <laughs> yeah. um, I think in most schools that wasn't the case at all. You know. Um, yeah. There, there was even less uh, less multicultural. Wasn't it? Absolutely, there was very. You know, it wasn't a multicultural kind of uh, space at all. And you know, this we're just talking like you know maybe twenty twenty five years ago. Uh, so Italy has changed a lot. Yeah. Um, and but how was that for you, growing up in that environment? And I'm asking this with a great deal of personal interest. I was yes. the, I was the only brown or black kid in my class yes. uh, for eight years, seven years at secondary school. Yeah. And at, at the time, you know, it was kind of it felt reasonably normal. But in retrospect, I know it completely wasn't. Yes. Uh, and and you know, it was quite isolating being the only black kid in the in the classroom. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for me, I just it just kind of motivated me to go beyond that, you know. I just always had a thing ever since I was very young, knowing that, like, okay, you know, I'm I'm a little kid now. <laughs> I have to go to school. I have to, you know, go through A, B, and C kind of uh, things. But my eye was always kind of looking out for the. I mean, that's part of the reason why I came here, London. Right. Okay. So. Your reasons for coming here to London, were, were they to do with music or were they to do with searching for somewhere that was more mixed culturally? Both. In the end, I think the, the broader reason was that, was searching for a place that could kind of give me the answers to the questions I had, the kind of, you know, cultural identity, you know, just the bigger, the bigger kind of questions I was beginning to ask myself that I couldn't find answers to in a space like Turin at the time, you know, um, and I think, you know, when I came to London, I just knew, okay, I'm probably going to be here for a while. There's, this is a space that offers things that, you know, I didn't even know at the time what it would offer me, obviously, but I, I just, I felt there was something here that was going to keep me. And then of course the music was a consequence of that because, uh, I had been working on music, but once I came to London, it just, Things, the connections just kind of happened naturally and the people came into place, the right people. And So this is where you flourished. You, you flourished musically <laughs> here. In a sense, yes. <laughs> was, there, was there no professional music career in Turin? Has it no. all happened in London? It's all happened in London. And when did you come, in, come to London? I came to London in 2003. Okay, and then your first album came out in... 2011. Two, 2011, yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay, so just take me through that. <laughs> How did music enter your life initially when you came to London? Well, so music had always been in my life. Ah, because you yes. said that it was in your home. Um, yeah. And I, through your family. Yes, I mean, I, I grew up kind of singing ever since I was, uh, you know, four years old. I was... I, I was always singing, I was always listening to a lot of music, just kind of eating it up. Um, and then I started singing in school and I started kind of doing little performances here and there. And then when I came to London, at the time I was uh, a student at SOAS. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, like, like, like uh, your number one fan here, Sophie Dunn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, and you came to London in 2002. <laughs> 2003. 2003, sorry. Um, I was studying and then I put a little, um, like a little announcement at the JCR. Yeah. Um, and I just said, you know, singer looking for guitarist. And, uh, well, I met a few guitarists, 
they weren't maybe the, the right fit um, but then eventually you know one day I was just sitting on the on the stairs in front of the, the main building at Soas and I saw this guy walk out of the building with like a guitar on his back and I just chased him down literally <laughs> just said hey do you, you know you obviously play guitar do you want to like jam I'm a singer I don't know if you're up for this and he was just like yeah sure um, and his name was Ian McLeod and he's one of my dearest friends to this day and he's the first guitarist that I started working with um, and who uh, later appeared on the on my first album You've Been Somewhere so Ian and I formed a band together actually mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for a while we were playing we were kind of playing covers and uh, you know like soul and jazz covers doing like uh, open mic nights um, but I'm just thinking that you identified yourself as a singer because you did not go to SOAS to uh, to study how to be a singer, right? No. You went there to study something else. Yeah, I, I didn't study music. I infiltrated myself a lot in, in a lot of the music <laughs> program. But but you, you had a sense of yourself as a singer. Yes, that's it, interesting. It, I don't big, know why. It's a yeah. big step. Because, yeah. yeah, <laughs> you know, to, to be able to own that I am a singer or yeah. I am a musician or in my case, I mean, for years I was working um, with kids, but I, I didn't actually call myself a DJ, but I was yeah. doing that yeah. on, on the side. It was only when I stopped working with kids and started to DJ full time, I then started to own that uh, that identity. Yes. But you owned your singing identity long before you were even vaguely professional. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's, I think that's just my recklessness. I think, I mean... I, I didn't have evidence or proof, you know, but I just, I knew that that's how I felt and that's, that's was a part of me, you know. Well, so. it's how you feel now. So <laughs> let's, let's get in another live track very quickly uh, because I'm conscious we've got two more to fit in and not that much yeah. of a show left, not so much of a show. We, we're going to be on there until 7.30. What's your third live track for us, Amira? Ah. Uh, we're not sure. We're uh, gonna think about it. Um, oh, Samiri. We're doing a track called Samiri, Let's which do means it. kindred spirit. Samiri. Here it comes. Then uh, kindred spirit Samiri uh, by Amira Care live on the World in London with DJ Ritu at uh, Resonance. Oh, res Resonance. Resonance at FM. <laughs>
part because uh, we want to fit in your final track as well. But before that, we've just got to ask you one or two very quick essentials questions. Amira, uh, which sits at the top of your list when you think about yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, is it as a musician, a composer, a songwriter, a singer or a performer? Ah, wait, say them again. <laughs> <laughs> musician, composer, songwriter, singer, performer. What's top of you? Definitely of you? not performer. Performer is not on the list at all. Um, I would say singer. Okay. Yes. The one that the one that hit you way back in uh, two thousand and three. Yes. When you knew it back then, when you first came to London, and you went searching for any random guitar player that you could find around Soas. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What's coming up next for Amira Care? We know that you're performing at the Cambridge Junction this Saturday, Feb February sixteenth. Uh, website uh, address. Mm. Yes. Plans, hopes for 2019. Yes, we're going to be playing um, in London and in Europe. Um, we are going to be playing in Paris uh, on the 5th of July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of a festival called Shabbat. Okay. Um, and then we have other dates coming up. It's all available on uh, visible on my website, which is www.amiracher.com. Perfect. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, Amira, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. The same it's such a pleasure. As Thank you. For you. With the band members as well. Thank you so much, uh, Michele, uh, Leandro, uh, Tal, and uh, uh, Nadir. Uh, well, that's it for this world in London. We return next Wednesday live, 4 pm at SOAS Radio and 6 30 here at Resonance of Him. Two shows from either side of the river every Wednesday. Till then, be well, be happy. Thank you very much for listening and thanks to Resonance FM, Patrick on Sound and the A World in London team. It's a namaste from me, DJ Ridu, and a final track from you, Amir Khair. What's it going to be? Thank you. It's going to be Mystic Dance. Let's take Ooh. it away. Thank you.